good afternoon it's wednesday the 24th of june 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian gerrish just say apologies for the uh, technical problems there a few little gremlins we couldn't say whether that was the virus or not but it was definitely a bug in the system and uh, we had hoped to have Vanessa Beely with us today but unfortunately we've not been able to make that connection but we'll do our best to cover that material uh, so but we're going to get started off with uh, with this uh, well we're open apparently the new freedom new find freedoms according to the BBC this morning 4th of July it's all very exciting our new find freedoms we should all be getting uh, really uh, geared up for going out for a pint or something uh, but is that the case well in fact uh, the mixed message from the mainstream media is as usual and this is more like uh, the thing you should really be scared uh, to go out for your pint uh, because of course as you mix with other people there's going to be COVID everywhere um, so be afraid be very afraid uh, this morning on the uh, Today program uh, Brian uh, they had uh, a couple of uh, teenagers or young people in their young 20s really pushing the idea that they're very scared to go out uh, they're scared to go out on dates they're scared to go out for a pint they're scared even to go out for picnics um, so uh, key sectors tourism hospitality can reopen from the 4th of uh, July uh, cinemas museums pubs brilliant stuff we can all go and uh, see go to the museum hairdressers. again I'm interested in a haircut at some uh, stage uh, hair, hairdressers yes hairdressers are available but you can't get your nails done Brian and uh, you can't go swimming and you can't uh, go to the gym right okay okay yeah so <laughs> so that's very important uh now music uh, if you're in the pub music has to be turned down low uh, you're only allowed to eat ketchup out of sachets you're not allowed it out of a bottle uh, pints have to be ordered using an app of some kind uh, and uh, so that's all good stuff and you're being serious here oh I am well I'm just making sure for viewers and particularly overseas viewers English may not be their first language there's no sarcasm in any of this uh, and uh, well apparently we're not allowed to gather in groups uh, of greater than 30 unless we are at a Black Lives Matter protest uh, and uh, we're not allowed to gather actually in groups of more than six uh, with people outside our sort of bubble uh, if you like uh, and if we don't observe the social distancing in the pubs in the shops and so on the police can be called so we should all be very happy about that two um, well let's move on to uh, to this guy because here's uh, professor john edmonds he's very concerned about this reopening uh, this does run the risk he says of allowing the epidemic to start to regain a foothold so we've got to be very careful because there's a second wave coming and uh, apparently sources close to sage told the times today or yesterday that uh, uh, reopening schools in september may not be possible uh, without shutting down parts of the economy again um, so <laughs> I, I've got to the point uh, Mike where I have to say live that I don't know what to say because uh, we're living in absolute fantasy land here this this is applied behavioral cycle this is an attack on the public it's quite clear this is madness controlling the country well uh, and of course we don't know who's uh, running the show either because Boris uh, yesterday saying that there's not currently a risk of a second peak that could overwhelm the NHS uh, and so the UK is still meeting all five of his tests uh, and so there's going to be further relaxation this is good stuff um, but uh, well let's have a look at this because um, there's been a an open letter published on the BMJ that's British Medical Journal uh, by the presidents of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons, Royal College of Nursing, Royal College of Physicians, also GPs, um, and uh, the president of the British Medical Association. Uh, and they're saying that a rapid and forward looking assessment is vital to avoid problems uh, in the future, uh, mainly a second wave. Um, they're saying that uh, this, this letter, this open letter to, to um, all the leaders of the political parties, um, is in response to calls in the BMJ for a public inquiry into uh, the UK's response to COVID-19. Uh, they were saying that, uh, that that now seems inevitable with political and public demands for one, uh, that com command widespread support, but they were concerned about the length of time for that it took to get, for example, the Bloody Sunday inquiry or the uh, Iraq inquiry up and running. It took years, and so they're arguing that it, that, uh, it doesn't have, that, that there isn't time for that. Uh, now, in terms of a second wave, of course, 
uh, because this is what they're all trying to, uh, to stop. Well, Germany claims to be having one at the moment. Let's do a quick translation of that. Uh, two uh, regions in Germany closed again uh, as a result of apparently 1,500 workers testing positive at a meat processing plant. Um, and so uh, this is what we're being so, set up for for this type of thing, regional shutdowns. So we'll be, probably won't see any more national shutdowns, but as second wave, third wave, fourth wave, whatever number of whatever waves. Whatever they decide yes, they're going to declare. It, it's going yeah. to be a regional shutdown on a city basis or, or a county basis and so on. So, uh, so there we are. Organised chaos. Um, Organised chaos, which Danny Kruger warned us about about five years ago with Nick Bowles. The two, uh, Danny Kruger was a Conservative candidate. Nick, um, Nick Bowles was a um, an MP at the time, and they both warned the public that the Tories planned to introduce a period of what they called creative destruction of everything to do with uh, the constitution and the public sector. We're now obviously witnessing that. Well, let's bring in the BBC, which is fully immersed in the brainwashing. And this is the incredible headline, coronavirus, how New Zealand got its coffees and fries back. Uh, so this is a stunning BBC uh, headline. Um, we decided we'd just take this article apart because it's an absolute disgrace. So the first thing to understand is the article's nothing to do with coffee and fries. The real agenda is the BBC promoting the New Zealand lockdown as the only valid COVID-19 health policy. But there's no detailed research by this journalist at all. This is just a construct of uh, sentences. Um, but of course, uh, the BBC plastered the article with free advertising for McDonald's. I think a lot of people who've been locked up in flats maybe haven't been able to, to uh, go out shopping for decent food. This is not the best advert, the BBC. But it also is, uh, aside from the chosen picture here from the lead article inside, it's saying it wasn't long before queues formed in front of coffee shops and McDonald's outlets as people rushed out. And so the BBC felt the need to uh, support McDonald's. And it's very interesting to notice in the article that McDonald's gets mentioned several times. It gets the picture, it gets their brand on screen, but the smaller coffee shops don't get any mention at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want them surviving. So let's see the sort of stuff it's got. Well, it says coffee and fast food seem to be the first thing on the mind of New Zealanders as the country emerged from almost five weeks of strict lockdown. And we're asking, how did Yvette uh, Tan, the BBC reporter, how could she make this claim? Because in the article, it doesn't appear that she spoke to anybody else in New Zealand. Um, did she actually go to New Zealand or is this all picked off social media? Well, I think it just came from social media, but uh, who's to know? So let's have a look at the doctors because these are key to the article. It's about coffee and uh, fries, of course, but let's bring in the doctors and see what they said. Well, Dr. Samantha Keane, a New Zealand based in Wellington, agreed. She said the ability to get a coffee and a scone made by someone else after weeks of doing it myself was a real tweet, treat, treat. I know it's hard to stick with this, isn't it? This is national, international news by the BBC. Who's Dr. Keane? Well, we'll come on to her in a minute. Like many people returning to work today, I've enjoyed a takeaway coffee. However, it's important not to congregate outside the cafes, the car park of takeaway places like McDonald's. Even the car park of McDonald's, that virus could be sneaking around there, Mike. Um, we do not want to see the sort of rebound we've seen in other countries. So this is the article seeded with doctors. Mm -hmm. This gives it some sort of gravitas. Uh, let's have a look at uh, who these people are. Uh, well, this is the first lady. Pretty confident this is the right lady. Possibly we've got two doctors of the same name. This does happen. But just found it fascinating that Dr. Samantha Keane, that we... Uh, found in our search to see who this lady was, criminologist expert in pornography, gender violence and rough sex. Um, so is a do doctor's opinion on the COVID scene any more valid, Mike, than any other member of the public? No. I don't think so. 
And then, of course, um, we jump across to this side because he's quoted as if he was somebody standing in the queue for coffee. But actually, the man quoted Dr. Ashley Bloomsfield is the key man in putting the New Zealand's lockdown policy in place. Was he uh, identified as such? He was, but it was done very casually. I missed it the first time through and I had to go looking and it wasn't till I found this Guardian article I could understand that this man, he's apparently the darling of New Zealand. And how does the BBC know that? Because it says they've checked social media. Ah. So it's, it's all good stuff. So was he in a queue for coffee or is this a completely constructed article from the BBC? I think I know. But let's just add another doctor to that uh, group of two, if we can pop that on screen. Um, we've also got this man mentioned, Associate Professor Sanjaya uh, Senanyaki, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, he gets quite a lot of uh, time. I'd say that, uh, OK, he's a medical professional, but it does seem to add to give weight to the New Zealand government's uh, policy. So what does the BBC conclude? Well, without any in-depth research or evidence, it says this, that the New Zealand government got it right because they closed their borders. Uh, it had a quick, clear lockdown. It traced and it tested it told people to stick to their bubble and it gave them a clear public message. Now, when you analyse this, the BBC provides no factual evidence to support this. It's just comment thrown in from one or two people. Uh, so there's no factual evidence to support the lockdown is best message. But it ends the article with surveillance and testing must continue and we must be vigilant for a surge. So there's the prime of the, mm -hmm. of the public's mind. And we'll add this as well. The subliminal BBC message is that we need clear messages from our leaders to keep us safe and tell us what to do. So just carry on with your coffee and your McDonald's and leave the thinking to us. And if you think that's all there is to this article, well, let's come back to the beginning because this to me was just incredible. This was the main image. And who is this? Well, it's, it's a New Zealand MP taking a selfie. And the quote is, it's just great to have a wee treat at the end of a pretty tough period in lockdown. Christopher Bishop, a local MP, told the BBC, adding that his order was a delicious sausage and egg McMuffin. Mike, this is, this is real. This is the BBC, the, the media team advising the world on safety and wars and everything else. This is sheer madness. The only person in the picture who knew what was going on was the dog. And uh, we were able to get comment. He said, yuck, don't put that in my bowl. Yeah. So at least the dog knew what the food was. Uh, but the other woman mentioned was uh, this lady and uh, Victoria Howe. So she gives a quote on how desperate it is to have a cup of coffee. That cup of coffee tasted amazing. And I felt a sense of normality come back into my life. So never mind you can't visit the elderly in nursing homes. Never mind you can't get anywhere. As long as you can get the coffee, you're fine. And uh, I did a little bit more research uh, where she gives some information on herself. And she says she's looking for the next step in her career due to COVID-19 has meant a job and location change. Well, I would imagine that's because the um, restaurant industry and the takeaway industry has been decimated and it looks like this unfortunate young lady has had to look for a new job. What's the BBC doing? Well, it's here on their web page, uh, top left, UK must prepare for second uh, virus wave. So BBC priming the population to get ready for the next bit of lockdown. And I'll just add, Mike, that when people go into prison, they are told, and this is in the policy, they have to be told very quickly how long their sentence is and the date upon which they will be released. And that's done because to be locked down, to be locked up in, in prison without knowing what the release date is, creates enormous stress and anxiety and uncertainty. So this is exactly uh, what the UK government is doing with the mind of the public at the moment. Uh, and if we have uh, groups of people that are uh, relatively relaxed about uh, the 
social distancing policy and so on. Other groups of people that are extremely concerned that they've still got to maintain social distancing, that it's still really dangerous to go out. Of course, what that's helping do is to do is to drive a wedge between people in their communities and create conflict. Which is exactly what the SAGE briefing document uh, said that it was going to do using the advice of the Behavioural Insights team, which has been boasting since uh, 2010 that it can change the way people think and behave in Britain and they won't even know what's been done to them. And I'll just add the Behavioural Insights team has still not responded to the UK column email asking for detail vaccine so let's just uh, remind ourselves what he had said factoring now even ahead of approval so we can build up a stockpile and be ready should it be clinically approved so we were making the point that this is an absolutely unprecedented situation that a commercial organization is going to start production on something that they haven't even had licensed yet uh, and we were asking, you know, what is the nature of this deal that they've struck? Is it that uh, they have agreed to be paid or there's a, they've had agreement that they will be paid whether or not uh, this uh, vaccine is approved? Or, or is it that in fact they've struck a deal that approval is assuring there's no, uh, there's nothing to prevent it uh, because it's just going to happen automatically? Well, perhaps we get a clue uh, from Matt Hancock yesterday. Uh, because he tweeted this out, very good news that the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill has today passed all its stages in the House of Commons. This is such an important step for life sciences, for innovation and for the NHS. So I'm going to thank uh, Jane for the tip on this, you made the point that he had tweeted this out. Um, so what's this all about? Well, this is a new bill which is uh, in going through Parliament at the moment. It's, as he says, it's gone through all the House of Commons stages. It's heading off now to the House of Lords. Uh, for uh, their perusal of it. Um, so let's have a quick look at what it's all about. Um, so the medical and medical devices bill, it's apparently a bill which is being caused by Brexit. Uh, so because we're separating ourselves from the EU and therefore there's, uh, we're separating ourselves from EU regulation in these matters, we've got to have our own legislation. Um, so it's got to increase the range of professions able to prescribe medicines, for example. Uh, in low risk cir circumstances. So that might be, uh, so it won't just, you know, we, we already know that doctors can prescribe medicines, also pharmacies, but perhaps it might go as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, other medical therapists, for, maybe, for example. Um, yeah. And uh, next, uh, it's going to introduce new regulations on medical devices, such as pacemakers, breast implants, ultrasound imagers to ensure patient safety. Um, and it's going to allow hospitals to develop personalized medicines. Um, so what they're going to do here is they're going to allow hospitals to use patient tissue and DNA samples to tailor treatments to individual patients uh, when other medicines have failed or to develop drugs that have been that have a short shelf life, uh, a shelf life maybe perhaps of minutes um, that would otherwise be unavailable to them. So perhaps this is this on the face of it, this looks good, but it doesn't end there. Uh, because here is the key point. Uh, it enables government ministers to make regulations amending or supplementing the law relating to human medicine, medicines and clinical trials. So we come back to the AstraZeneca thing. Have AstraZeneca been assured that uh, their, the They're approval for their account. vaccine yeah. is absolutely guaranteed? That's the question. But this is, uh, some people are talking about when they're describing this bill, they're talking about Henry VIII powers. This is a term which started to be used during the Brexit process itself when uh, Theresa May's government was trying to push through stuff without parliamentary approval. But perhaps a better uh, term for this would be an enabling act. If it goes through, it's an enabling act. It basically well, they, they simply create the law to their own satisfaction. They simply... Well, the key point here is that, that, that within this legislation is the power for the Secretary of State to make stuff up as he goes along without any parliamentary scrutiny. Yeah. Um, so it is an enabling act, and I think that's uh, an important term for people to, to consider. Um, so AstraZeneca, the, their, the fact that they're in production already, I think there's some questions need to be asked and answered around that. And the question is, well, one of the questions is, is this legislation going to help enable um, them 
to justify the production without having any approval in place for and, the vaccine. And equivalent future deals that are put together in this way. Uh, absolutely. Pre-agreed. Uh, absolutely. Now, if you uh, like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. Uh, and uh, there are options to help us out there and your help much needed, much appreciated. Now, as Brian said, uh, it's really... We're really sorry that Vanessa is not on with us. Uh, we had a technical problem this morning. I don't know where that's come from. And unfortunately, that has prevented that. Uh, but uh, let's just run through a couple of the items here. Uh, and we'll, we will get Vanessa on again uh, in the not too distant future. But we start off uh, with this massive explosions from after Israeli jets strike army bases in central uh, Syria. So. Um, I, she spoke to me last night uh, and uh, was uh, explaining what was going on here. Israel, of course, coming over the border as usual um, and uh, just bombing the place. Now, this is the uh, statement from the Syrian military, from a Syrian military source at 2117 on June the 23rd. Hostile air targets appeared from the east and northeast of Palmyra and fired several missiles at some of our military sites uh, west of Deir Ezzor. Um, in parallel, one of our military locations was targeted near Salkad, south of Sweda, uh, which caused two martyrs and four wounded soldiers, in addition to the material damage left by the aggression. But, Brian, there is no comment internationally about the fact that uh, Israel continues to uh, ignore uh, sovereign borders and uh, continues to attack Syria in this way. So we've got, effectively, uh, Israel... On one side, we've got the United States still occupying the northeast of the country, and we've got Turkey in the northwest, uh, and it looks like um, Syria is on its way to uh, a sort of balkanization uh, process where um, large chunks of it are being chopped away or around the edges, and perhaps there'll be uh, something left in the center, but perhaps not much. Yeah, and, and I have to say, I find it very interesting, the timing of this, what's a major attack, of course, in the middle of the COVID crisis, where other countries are preoccupied with internal matters. So, um, uh, yeah, dangerous stuff. We think it's all quiet and down in the Middle East and in Syria. And then out of the blue, we get another major attack, which, of course, raises tensions and takes us further down the path towards some major confrontation now, absolutely now the other the other thing that's absolutely getting no uh media coverage in the west uh, but i think it's really important to report we'll report it uh, gently here but we'll get vanessa on to just go into this in more detail um this is reuters uh, syrian kurdish authorities to stop wheat uh, going to government territory um so of course uh, where the united states is occupying is is largely uh, the areas that the Kur the kurdish population in Syria exists. Um, and uh, well, we're starting to see attacks now on the, uh, the food supplies for Syria for the coming winter. And this is, uh, this is pretty dangerous. Trump ordered US forces to burn hectares of wheat fields in Syria amid COVID-19 pandemic. That's coming from the Russian media and is reported here in International Business Times. And just to show a couple of uh, images from this, uh, this is uh, one image from Sana. Uh, and uh, a, a slightly more uh, serious, emotive, yeah, yeah, absolutely emotive image uh, here. So we've got uh, crops being burnt uh, at a time when, you know, we've got shutdown internationally of businesses, of companies, of farming. Uh, we're going to risk a dangerous period for food supplies. And of course, in Syria, uh, they have their borders closed, uh, sanctions continuing. Um, and uh, and we've got this type of activity going on. Uh, this is not looking good for the country in this coming winter. And we've winter. still got British special forces uh, operating in Syria, although, of course, David Cameron several years ago said there would no, be no British boots on the ground in Syria. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, but if there's warfare going on there, uh, the war rhetoric continues to build internationally. Uh, and so uh, at the end of last week, the U.S. published this, the Defense Space Strategy Summary for June 2020. 
Um, so this is uh, what they're describing as a new military space strategy, strategy which identifies how de the Department of Defense will advance space power to be able to compete to deter and win in a complex security environment characterized by great power competition. So we're back into this idea of great power competition. And of course, the whole Syrian thing is uh, about great power competition, apparently. So the issue also issued a fact sheet that goes alongside this, this particular uh, report. Uh, and here's what they're saying. Chinese and Russian strategic intentions and capabilities present urgent and enduring threats to the, cap the ability of the department to achieve its desired conditions in space. Um, so again, the focus on China and Russia. Uh, so they've so I just um, just highlight here because of uh, what's coming up in a few minutes in the, in the news, Mike, that Chinese and Russian strategic intentions and capabilities pre present urgent and enduring threats. Yes. Yeah, that's so the key I'd just point. like to emphasize that in Abs this paper. Absolutely. So what are they saying here uh, that uh, they want to build a comprehensive military advantage in space? They want to integrate military space power into national joint and combined operations. They want to shape the strategic environment and they want to cooperate with allies, partners, industry and other US government departments and agencies. Uh, and uh, so the Secretary of State, uh, of course, Mark Esper, uh, said uh, the defense space strategy is the next step to ensure space superiority and to secure the nation's vital interests in space now and in the future. We desire a secure, stable and accessible space domain that underpins our na nation's security, prosperity and scientific achievement. However, our adversaries have made space a warfighting domain and we have to implement enterprise wide changes to policies. Uh, strat strategies, operations, investments, capabilities and expertise for this new strategic environment. So there you go. So I wonder what the Russian response to this might be. Well, let's have a look. Uh, they issued uh, a uh, statement uh, accusing the Americans of citing provisions of the 2014 Russian military doctrine without any concrete details as a factor for turning outer space into an area for combat operations. So again, what we have, as we've seen with NATO, uh, we have the United States and the West claiming that the Russians are doing one thing and that that justifies their actions. Uh, when in fact, the Russians are saying, well, no, this isn't the case at all. You guys are, are taking the first steps here by misrepresenting our position. Um, and uh, uh, and so you know, inevitably the Russians are going to have to act, the Chinese are going to have to act, as we'll see in a second. So this is Konstantin uh, Kosachev, who's uh, Russian Foreign Affairs Committee, saying, I'm not saying that you're placing some sort of weapons in space, but in any case, there's no willingness to discuss legally binding documents on the prevention of the militarization of space. We'll come on to uh, Vladimir Putin a little later. This is the Russian position again. Nobody's prepared to sit down at the table and have a conversation yeah, because about what, it. What we're seeing coming out of the UK um, and the US on many occasions is sheer rhetoric, Mike. We're not seeing the evidence if they're talking about Syria, chemical attacks. We never see the evidence. The rhetoric coming out of the West at the moment is on a par with what we used to point a finger saying was coming out of the Soviet bloc originally. Uh, it's, it's, it, it seems things have things turned 180 reversed. degrees. Absolutely. In the meantime, uh, there are negotiations going on over nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, and this is uh, Robert A. Wood, who is the uh, US permanent representative on disarmament. Uh, and uh, well, he, you would perhaps expect him to be conciliatory, uh, sort of encouraging Russia to bring, come to the table uh, and, and take part in the conversation uh, about getting rid of, uh, of uh, nuclear weapons and so on. But no, uh, he's trying to game the whole thing by bringing China into the mix as well. So uh, there's some real concerns here in the United States about China's nuclear buildup. And we don't really have a great sense of what that exact buildup looks like, except that we do know that China has been developing mobile uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so he has uh, given this impression that China is uh, becoming a real major uh, serious uh, risk in terms of nuclear power and needs to be brought into these uh, these um, conversations. And he's saying, we think it's imperative that China comes to the table and there'll be a seat there in Vienna for them. We hope they'll show up. Now, this uh, this uh, negotiation uh, began on Monday 
Um, and uh, of course, China didn't show up. China's attitude, as it already stated, uh, was this. Uh, we've noted the U.S. keeps dragging China into the new START extension issue between the U.S. and Russia. It's just the same old trick it plays whenever it seeks to shift responsibility to others. Um, and uh, so, uh, as the Chinese have said here, indeed they did uh, create a, a seat for them. Here we are. Here's the ambassador, uh, Marshall S. Billing Billingsley. Uh, Vienna talks about the start. China is a no-show. Beijing still hiding behind hashtag Great Wall of Secrecy on its crash nuclear buildup and so many other things. We will proceed with Russia notwithstanding. Well, of course, China's argument here is that, you know, the United States and Russia have been uh, have been building up nuclear arsenals for decades uh, and China hasn't. Its nuclear arsenal is still st significantly smaller. Their defense spending is significantly smaller than the United States. Uh, and so they don't really understand why they're being dragged into this conversation other than as a political pawn. Uh, but in order to keep the pressure on then, the same ambassador who's supposed to be talking about nuclear non-proliferation and reducing the levels of nuclear weapons is busy pushing this out. The F-35A is the world's most sophisticated jet. Uh, it is dual use capable and part of the United States unwavering commitment to extending deterrence. NATO is a nuclear alliance and he's pushing this article from the, av from the aviationist. Uh, here are the first photos of the F-35A uh, jets dropping inert uh, nuclear warheads uh, and uh, uh, nuclear missiles. So. Um, we can have a conversation about what we think about the F-35 and its capability. Uh, but the point here is that at a time when we're supposed to be talking about non-proliferation and reducing the levels of nuclear weapons in the country, the US keeps pushing uh, the pressure, keeping the pressure on Russia and now on China as well. And you've got to ask why they're doing this. There can't be any other response from Russia and China other than a negative one. Yeah, and we, we got to ask the key question, you know, within the US administration, within UK, who is actually driving this very aggressive policy? It's, it's too close from UK and USA for there not to be collusion with what's going on here. The message coming across is, is the same one. But who is it actually driving the governments? This is, this is the key question mm -hmm. to ask, I think. Germany's on armed forces. Oh, I do apologise. Germany's armed <laughs> forces, right? So, well, this is Foreign Policy magazine. Now, this is really interesting. The, the headline here is uh, "Sorry, state of Germany's armed forces." Trump's call to withdraw U.S. troops from the country are impulsive, but Germany isn't blameless. There's a number of issues wrong with this article. The suggestion that Trump's calls to withdraw U.S. troops from Germany are impulsive is simply wrong because Trump has been on this issue since 2016. He has been arguing that the European Union countries are not putting enough money into defence uh, and he's been calling on them to do so and to do so on a quicker timeline than they are pushing. Um, so, but uh, Germany isn't blameless. Well, of course, the Foreign Policy magazine article doesn't uh, cover anything to do with the fact that, that all European national militaries have been decimated in order to drive the European Defence Union. Uh, but the key point here is that, what, that, that this is all about the threat that Trump made to withdraw troops from Germany last week in time for the uh, NATO defence ministers meeting. Uh, and what's happening is those troops apparently are now being sent to Poland. Um, and uh, the Polish government very, very excited to be getting more troops uh, from Germany into Poland. US troops, they've already got several thousand US troops stationed there. They want more. Um, and of course, this puts additional pressure on Russia once again. Um, so what, uh, come back to what is Russia's response to this? Um, well, Vladimir Putin published this uh, fantastic article, and I really recommend everybody goes and reads this. It's very long, but it's worth the read. It's in the national interest. Uh, it's also on the Russian, uh, the presidential website. Um, but uh, he is... Uh, the title is Vladimir Putin, The Real Lessons of the 75th Anniversary of World War II, uh, published last week. Uh, now, he does talk about Poland, for example. He talks about the fact that uh, Poland was engaged in the partition of Czechoslovakia, along with Germany in the run-up to the Second World War. Uh, they decided together in advance who would get what Czechoslovakian territories. Uh, and he also makes the allegation that Poland was aware about Hitler's support uh, sorry, was aware that without Hitler's support, uh, it's Poland's annexationist plans were doomed to fail. Um, now, 
uh, I asked Alex Thompson what he thought about uh, about Putin's article here, and he said, well, it's full of previously obscure details on the Franco-British push to make Poland overlord of uh, various Eastern European areas, including Belarus, uh, Belarusia, and uh, to weaken the uh, Czechos and weaken Czechoslovakia and so on. Um, some of our archives, uh, Alex says, on this are still sealed. Um, and of course, it also be, uh, reinforces uh, Peter Hitchens' most recent book uh, on this. So uh, this is Putin's ar article. He's going through the history of the Second World War, about the history of cooperation between Russia, the United States and the UK uh, as a result of the Second World War. But he ends it uh, with this, and this is the key point. There can be no doubt that a summit of France, China, Russia and the United States today and the UK will play an important role in finding common answers to modern challenges and threats. And he says, and will demonstrate a common commitment to the spirit of alliance, to those high humanist ideals which, and values for which our fathers and grandfathers fought shoulder to shoulder. And he is once again calling Brian for the main powers in the world to stop playing these stupid geopolitical games sit down around a table, have a conversation about, a sensible conversation about things uh, and sort it out because he is expressing a concern that the, that the planet is heading towards a major conflict. Yeah. Uh, well, our key problem at the moment is uh, who's the government, who is the government in UK and what sort of government is that? Uh, we've regularly talked about UK's government of occupation. Uh, we say this because we don't believe that the uh, political party structure is actually providing the uh, Conservative government at the moment. We've got something far darker and deeper going on. Uh, let's have a look at this uh, Sky report, which is uh, saying that uh, there's been anger over the delays in setting up a spy watchdog in UK and the release of the Russia report. And this was my interjection a little bit earlier in the news that uh, we've got We've got the USA, we've got the UK government constantly saying to us that Russia and China are such a threat. Uh, but here we've got an article where there's delays over reports coming out. So let's have a look at this. The MP in question is Tobias Elwood, and this is what he had to say. He urged Boris Johnson to understand the urgency of the need to reconstitute the powerful Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, he said he would hate to see the government somehow having anything to hide. I found that a very interesting statement, Mike. I would hate to see the government somehow having anything to hide or perhaps too distracted to complete this appointment or even it doesn't value its role. Um, very interesting little sharp barbs there from this man. Uh, we, we, we've had our own questions about Tobias Elwood, but I think those comments very, very interesting. I'm sure none of these apply in this situation, but the quicker we can get this committee in place, the better. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament. Uh, and this is the um, UK government website where it's talking about the committee and it's saying what the current status is. But I'll draw this one out first, that basically it's saying that uh, there's been a stalling. That's what the website says, that it's been stalled. But uh, has it been stalled or has it been blocked? So we haven't got the report out on the Russian threat to UK. So you're showing, Mike, that once again, we're saying that those uh, nasty Russians are going to come and, and kill us. The Chinese are up to no good. But we haven't got the report on the Russian threat to UK out because... Um, this government of occupation, this conservative government, has been stalling it. It's remarkable, isn't it? Remarkable. Inquiry into security issues relating to China. Well, that hasn't come out either. And yet uh, we're now seeing once again that we can take their 5G equipment, but we, we can't trust the Chinese because uh, they're a major threat. But the government doesn't want to issue that security report. It doesn't want to issue the inquiry into right-wing terrorism. It doesn't want to issue the examination into the current Northern Ireland terror threat. And there was also a case study into GCHQ procurement it doesn't want to talk about or issue. Now, the last one, you could say, oh, well, 
that doesn't sound very important but of course what has GCHQ been procuring this is what we need to know has it been procuring uh, equipment facilities know-how in order to integrate with other foreign powers that it's not telling the UK public about so this is the organization the intelligence and security committee and it doesn't exist at the moment and Boris Johnson's uh, government doesn't seem to want it to exist and we have to ask why but what's it supposed to be doing this it's supposed to be overseeing the policies expenditure administration and operations of MI5 MI6 GCHQ defense intelligence the joint intelligence organization the national security secretariat and the office for security and counterterrorism so nobody Mike is overseeing this massive uh, state spying operation nobody is overseeing it it's now freelance we have no idea what it's doing and of course what this doesn't even tell us is that in the same period that we haven't had this oversight uh, we've now got an announcement that British Army 77 Brigade has become a key intelligence asset spying on the British people so I think it's reasonable for us to be saying well um, hang on a minute if you're going to reinstate some oversight we need some oversight on 77 Brigade uh, because the British Army's operations need to be made fully uh, transparent to the British public uh, will they do that well I think that's going to take massive government pressure so I think we can say today that when viewers and listeners to UK columns say but what can we do here you've got a very clear opportunity to get on the case of Tobias Elwood to be demanding that transparency is brought back to this deep state machinery and that 77 Brigade is included because we have no idea what they've been up to apart from apparently helping the government suppress anybody who dares challenge COVID-19 policy so we just put a label up there who controls UK politics um, is it the army and the intelligence services that are forming the new government of occupation and I think we've got to say it's beginning to look that way um, we just pop up your excellent uh, diagram Mike if you could take us through well I mean this is the key point isn't it Brian if, the, if that organization or that uh, group doesn't exist then there's no oversight over Mark Sedwell uh, and his running of GCHQ the security service the secret intelligence service the new bio uh, joint biosecurity center and of course he's also uh, responsible for the rapid response unit which is all about shutting down uh, narratives which are counter to the UK's narrative the national security communications team which is all about propaganda 77 brigade which is about both of those things uh, and the new 13th signals as well so so what oversight is there over this little uh, nest that well, he has built for the himself there's no oversight no oversight no transparency for the British public so we have at this point in June 2020 in UK we have absolutely no idea who's controlling the British government but we know that the British intelligence services are now working hand in glove with the British army in order to spy on uh, British people as well as conduct their operations overseas mm and uh, somebody's quite rightly just pointed out in our chat room that of course it was Francis Maud who announced that Brit Britain's intelligence services including GCHQ were going to be working hand in glove with um, unit 8200 which was the Israeli intelligence military intelligence organization so we don't even know whether these these uh, vehicles of uh, of British military and intelligence we don't even know whether they're fully under control of UK at the moment a lot of questions to be asked and opportunity for the British public to demand answers starting via Mr Elwood we'll follow that one along but um, if the threat is pretty severe we shouldn't worry Mike because uh, well perhaps we should this is the report from the mail on the Royal Navy HMS Hopeless a 1 billion Royal Navy warship has spent four years stuck in port because of engine problems and a shortage of sailors uh, so she's been sitting in Portsmouth Harbour since 2016 and she spent a total of six days at sea 
Now I'm going to use the word outrage again because this should be a national outrage. We haven't got money to support the NHS or schools or the homeless or anything else. We can throw away a billion pounds, um, but it's actually worse because the um, six Type 45 destroyers at a billion each uh, were at sea for a combined total of 649 days last year. So six ships can just about manage a combined total of uh, uh, 649 days, to which I smile and say back in the Cold War, we had very old steam-driven frigates uh, that were spending 61, 62, 63% of the year at sea. Mm. Uh, but now we suddenly can't do it. Now, is this, is this an accidental collapse of uh, mod procurement, Mike, or is this deliberate chaos uh, created inside the Royal Navy? Well, let's have a look at the comments that the Mail chose to give. So this is from Lord West. Uh, we should have pushed ahead as soon as we knew that, uh, what the problem was. And it's dreadful that it's taken so long. Mike, it's, it's, it's dreadful, it's truly dreadful. We need to get them fixed and out there operating. We need ships in case we have a war. Um, you're smiling. I'm smiling here. But is, is this proper intelligent analysis or, or is, this, is this meaningless comment designed to, to fool the public and dumb us down? Well, it is the Daily Mail. So the question is, did he actually say it? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I think he probably did because of the language, but actually where's the substance, where's the outrage? A billion pounds for one ship, so presumably six billion for all six of them, and they can't go to sea. But uh, if that wasn't bad enough, this is what the Ministry of Defence had to say. Type 45 destroyers are held at various levels of readiness in accordance with defence requirements. They rotate through planned operating cycles involving maintenance, training, deployment, leave and upgrades, including the power improvement project to fix the engines, which is now underway. This, this mic is just disgraceful stuff here because um, there's no meaningful comment at all. Millions of billions of pounds thrown away. Um, and we're using this sort of language in order to deceive the public. Mm. So if anybody else is feeling outraged, and well, you should, your opportunity to get onto Britain's Ministry of Defence and demand answers as to why we can't get ships at sea and we can simply throw away billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. I think we better end there, Mike. Yes. Uh, thank you, our viewers and listeners, for joining us. Um, Please pass on the word, explain to other people what's happening. A uh, comment from one of our viewers uh, yesterday uh, was that they're stunned to see the UK being, quote, ripped apart. And clearly that's happening. We simply need to identify who those deep state agents are mm. doing the business. We'll leave it there. We'll be back at the same time on Friday. Bye. Bye. -bye.